This is a work session to discuss both the senior citizen uh, assistance property tax that, that we're considering and also uh, we want to hear from the, the folks with the suit at this uh, expanding the zoo district include St. Charles County. So that being said, I think we want to begin with the folks from the zoo, zoo district. So who would be here for the zoo district? Is it go right here or where would you like to go? You can go. A little tight right there. there. Or you can sit here with us if you'd like. Have a seat. Where you are. Why don't you guys sit down, grab a couple chairs, and. Thank you. Well, good evening, folks. My, my name is Matt Geeky. I'm chairman of the St. Louis Zoo Association. That's a not for profit group. Uh, it's a comprised of a diverse group of business folks, community leaders in the region. And one thing that's common about all of us is we share a a love for and a passion for what the St. Louis Zoo does. Joining me this evening is Dr. Bonner, who's president and CEO of the zoo. Uh, we have Cynthia Holter, who's vice president of external relations. And with me here on my left is Jeff Rainford. He's helping us with our discussions with the uh, various folks around the St. Louis metropolitan region. Um, I'm sure you know the St. Louis Zoo is <clears throat> uh, not just a place where folks go to see wonderful exhibits, wonderful animals, exotic animals. Uh, it, it's part of our fabric, part of the St. Louis fabric, part of the fabric of the metropolitan region, our history. Uh, it's got a wonderful reputation that really unites all the folks throughout the St. Louis metropolitan area. Um, it's a place where St. Louisans of all stripes, uh, in all parts of our region, all ages, consider to be something that's a great source of pride. Uh, we have not, we don't have a, I've heard somebody say once before, we don't have a mountain, we don't have a mountain, we don't have an ocean, uh, but what we do have is the arch, we got the cardinals, doing pretty darn well, and we certainly have the country's best, and I, a little bit of my pride comes out, I'll say the, the, the world's best zoo. Uh, the people of our region, including uh, the folks here in this room, uh, your constituents, love the zoo. Um, your constituents see the zoo as a great family attraction, uh, a great tourist attraction and something that they love and would like to see remain free and affordable for them and their families. Um, the folks on the Zoo Association, those of us who help manage and, and uh, run the zoo on behalf of the people in the, uh, St. Louis, have a responsibility though to keep it that way, not only for the here and now, of course, but for generations to come. And that's getting a little bit more difficult, and you've probably heard a little bit about that. We'll talk more about that here. Our finances have been getting a little bit tighter. We've managed that fairly well, and most folks wouldn't even really recognize or notice any sort of difference. But the day is in sight when the zoo uh, is going to face some operating uh, deficits. The zoo is also beginning to show our age. So we'll need to uh, create some money to find some money to keep the zoo operating the way it is today and keep it uh, safe and, and functioning like the way we love it today. And we know the people of St. Louis expect us to remain uh, the world leader in animal conservation and to continue to improve the zoo experience with new uh, habitats. So, you know, getting to the point, that's why you've heard about the enabling legislation uh, that's now before the folks in Jeff Jefferson City that would allow you here in St. Charles as well as the folks in the city of St. Louis and the counties of uh, St. Louis and Franklin and Jefferson to submit a small sales tax increase uh, to help support the St. Louis Zoo. Now, it would be no more than an eighth of a cent, uh, perhaps less than that. Uh, but we're not going to ask you to cons consider submitting anything <coughs> to your voters until we're ready to tell you and your constituents why we need it, uh, how much we're going to need, and what we're going to use it for, <coughs> and what you're going to get out of that investment. It would be up to you, you folks here, to decide whether it should go on the ballot and how much to go on the ballot and when it's going to go on the ballot. We strongly believe that the decision about the St. Louis Zoo's future should be made here in St. Charles County. The county executive, not the governor, should do it. 
the county council, the folks here, not the general uh, assembly should decide. That's what our legislation would do and it's up to the voters. I'd like to ask Dr. Bodner now to share us a little bit more detail with you. Well, Matt alluded to the fact that we have some, some pressing uh, financial issues. Probably the most immediate concern is a backlog of deferred maintenance. Uh, you know, we're, we're over a century old now. Our, our oldest building is about our flight structures, but flight cage is going to turn 112, I think, uh, pretty soon this year, in fact. So and we've done a good job, I think, keeping up with deferred maintenance. Over the last eight years, we've spent almost $62 million to get at that backlog. So that's, that's extraordinary. The problem is we got almost $52 million left to spend. Now, if, if it were just that, it might not be so bad, but every year, somewhere between five and $11 million comes on in new deferred maintenance. So it's, it's, it's a, big, a big hurdle to catch up with, and then every year, more and more accrues. So that's, that's I think, the first problem, and, uh, and, and that's a significant one. Uh, a second problem really deals with, as Matt said, this, the issues related to the uh, uh, revenue and expense lines. Basically, in terms of revenues, we have three different things that we can, can draw from. First off, taxes. The problem with taxes is that they're flat. Okay, they just haven't gone up in years, and they're not likely to go up anymore. Uh, earned income accounts for about a third of our budget. And we always say there's only so much you can charge for a hamburger before people just stop at McDonald's before they start coming. In other words, there's a, there's a limit on what price increases can do. And a third of our budget comes from philanthropy, but that can be very uneven at times, and uh, uh, I think very difficult to rely on. And let's face it, there are, there are practical limits to how much money people are, are, are willing to give you. So. Uh, when we look at our budget projections, we're looking at about five years before revenue and expense begin to cross, but that assumes that you're not doing anything about all the deferred maintenance, which is something that we just can't afford to do. Uh, we also have some very pressing needs for conservation breeding space. Uh, we thought the Grants Farm would solve those issues. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be moving in that direction, but we still have the same problem that we have to deal with. So that's a significant issue. And, Finally, I guess you'd have to say that there's things that we could be doing that we're not that people would like to see us do more of. I think everybody wants Scully to get a baby. <laughs> All sorts of fun things that could be done. Grants Farm is off the table. Grants yes. Farm is absolutely yes. off the Why table. Why don't you need to say that three more times? Oh, okay. Grants Farm is 100% off the table. You want me to say for the St. Louis Zoo Association emphatically? Yes. 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 I wanted to let you Zoo. folks know we've just burned up about half the time. Oh, yeah. okay. So we let me all, turn it over to We all realize it's a great institution and we, are, we understand your funding issues. But we all have some questions too. So if you got, if you want to wrap up with what you they want, the the so my name is Jeff Rainford, and I'm uh, helping the zoo get feedback and engage uh, the, the the people of the city of St. Louis and the four counties. I'm I have the results of a poll we did in St. Charles County. I'm going to zip through those so that you can get questions. So uh, if you want me to come back and go into more depth, I will. I'm only going being brief to be respectful. You, you know, you want to ask questions. So we, we polled 400 people in St. Charles County in February. Uh, the, a quick summary is um, the people of St. Charles County are very happy to live in St. Charles County. A question we call the right direction, wrong direction. The right direction was 74%, which is a very, very high number. So they are very happy with St. Louis County. They also love the zoo. St. Uh, Charles I'm County. sorry, St. Charles. actually the St. Louis County number was not quite as good. So they're very happy uh, to live in St. Charles County. It was the highest number of the city in the four counties that we did. Um, the zoo itself also is very popular in St. Charles County, <laughs> more popular than astronauts. 94% of the people surveyed in St. Charles County view the zoo favorably, 82% view it very favorably. Um, to skip ahead, they also think the zoo is a good steward of money, only 11% think the zoo wastes too much tax money. And some of you know I worked for Mayor Slay for 14 years. <laughs> had a number that was at 11 percent and we did the best we could mm. we we did ask them about an eighth of a cent and that is not that is the cap that we have in our legislation uh in st charles county an eighth of a cent pulled at 68 percent yes 24 percent no and the strong yeses were 48 percent the strong no's were 14 percent we also asked a lot of questions about the free zoo and in essence uh, the, the, the people including of st charles county of the region have an emotional attachment and very a great deal of pride about the free zoo uh real quickly we asked them one of the questions we gave them three uh three uh, uh positions and asked them which one was closer to their point of view one is the zoo should be free even if it meant a sales tax and in st charles county 59 percent wanted to be free even if it means a sales tax. We, and then lastly, we asked them about St. Charles County being part of the region 
uh, and I'll read you the question. Taxpayers in St. Louis City and St. Louis County already pay a property tax for the zoo, the science center, and other regional attractions. Taxpayers in St. Charles County should start doing their fair share by paying a small sales tax. 61% of your, your uh, voters uh, thought that that was a convincing uh, argument. Um, and then lastly, everybody and all of the counties basically uh, believed that Grant's Farm should stay in the Bush family and the Bush family should run it and the zoo uh, should not. We asked, uh, should Billy Bush uh, buy Grant's Farm and keep it in his family or should the zoo buy Grant's Farm even if it meant a sales tax increase? And the zoo in St. Charles County got 26% and Billy got 60%. Mm -hmm. So um, the people of St. Louis want the zoo to focus on the zoo. <laughs> So that is a really quick run through. I wanted to give you a flavor of it. Like I said, if you want us to come back, uh, we can. Yeah, the, uh, the thing that comes to mind, I've heard this over, and a lot of the, my the constituents have been, have been coming to me, is why not a small uh, mission fee? You're already charging a mission <coughs> fee at the, what the, uh, the, um, the bot botanical gardens, OK? Uh, and the reason do, I'm saying that is because the fact that um, sales taxes are regressive, meaning that uh, folks in my district that might be a working family in Wentzville, it, that creates, uh, takes more of their budget than somebody that's eating, for instance, lobsters in Ladue. So they're regressive. They also are disadvantaged of small businessmen, which I am one, because every time the sales tax goes up, we're at more and more of a disadvantage to, to online retailers like Amazon. So I just went to the Dallas Museum of Natural History, it was $15 to get in, okay? Very similar <coughs> learning experience to what you folks have without live animals. The new St. Louis Blues Museum is $15 to get in. I, I don't understand the insistence on free admission. And, and, and well, there's lots of reasons, but I'll let them <coughs> this from the zoo site. So, so a, a couple of points here in, in response. What we are looking at a, a variety of different mechanisms for how to raise the revenue. That's why we're getting ahead of this. We're talking about five years. But there's a certain amount of, if you will, elasticity that as we begin to charge those admissions. There's, there's actually several issues here. One, well, then we might see the attendance go down, and we, we have to test that. Also, the current legislation precludes us from doing that. So that's why you, could, you can walk in free, but for instance, go around the carousel. Uh, we might charge for that or other things. So there's there's that issue, um, but but the um, you take a look at for instance uh, some of the other zoos. If we were to try to just switch the model around, it's I was in San Diego Zoo a little while ago. It's fifty dollars for me to walk in if you're going to bring a family of four in and park for twenty five bucks. I think that would hurt your family folks in Wentzville a whole lot more than the sales tax. I understand increase. it, but what about a five or ten dollar admission? Yeah, and that's where we're looking at that sort of uh, those dynamics. And if you can change the law that we can collect sales tax out here for your district, why can't you get the law changed to be able to charge admission? Okay, and then also I'd like to personally see some revenue projections. If I've read what I can read online, but you know what what type of admission fee would be required to get you to take care of this gentleman's capital improvements plans? So they're yeah. kind of going through the business limitations yeah. of charging. Um, so every city is different, but uh, one of the things that is a highlight of St. Louis is a free zoo. Now there are other places have different highlights. You go to Portland and it's you know it's homemade beer or whatever. When you come to St. Louis, and it showed up in our polling, a very high percentage of your residents would rather pay a sales tax than see an admissions charge. I think it's a big part of St. Louis's identity. People are, are emotionally attached to it. There's a history behind it. And overwhelmingly, and on, as far as a different kind of tax, people told us they don't want it to be the property tax. So I get what you're saying about the taxes, but the fact of the matter is your constituents prefer the sales tax to the property tax and certainly to an income tax. But you know, in all of the counties, and it's as strong in your county as it is in St. Louis City and St. Louis County, people are wedded to the idea of a free zoo. Maybe it's because they have family that comes in from out of town. Maybe it's because they don't, you know, it just feels good to walk in the door and not have to pay for it. Maybe because it's part of St. Louis's identity. But uh, it's a, you know, other cities are different, but in St. Louis, it's a big deal that it's a free zoo. How many? How many visitors a year do you project to come to the zoo? Well, a little, little over 3.2 million. 3.2 million? Yes, sir. And um, how many zoos are in, in the United States? Approximately. How many zoos? Accredited, in the United States. Uh, accredited 212 zoos. accredited zoos and aquariums. And then how many zoos are free? There are three uh, important zoos that are free. Lincoln Park in Chicago, the St. Louis Zoo, and the National Zoo in Washington. Three? Okay. Three out of 212. Uh, 112, right? So if there are 3.2 million, uh, when you guys are talking about funding, you're talking about 
100, 200 million, I suppose, I suppose. Is that we're, looking, we're projecting hundreds of millions of dollars on some kind of, is that what you're looking for? For the sales tax? No, no, to pro, you're, for uh, capital improvements and. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, it would be in the yes, sir. Lands, right. Okay. All right. As far as revenue projections, we will be coming back and showing you, you know, full revenue, uh, how much the zoo takes in, how short it's going to be, where the money would go, and all that. You know, we wanted to start the dialogue tonight. This is obviously not the, even close to the last time that you'll see us. What, what do you anticipate if you get us in Jefferson County to, and maybe in Illinois County to pass us? What do you project for revenue coming off that eighth percent? Off an eighth? Yeah, rock the bottom. Well. It's going to be less than an eighth. Let me just give you a tenth. If all, if the city of St. Louis and all four counties were in at a tenth, it's 29 million. And if it was a sixteenth, what did I say? 24 million. Right. So that equates to a ten dollar mission fee. Three million. People Remember, we don't, we won't have a lot of time. Maybe we should yeah. be prepared to come back and talk. Sure. Mm -hmm. But if you charge an admission fee, you'll have fewer people yes. going in. You'll have fewer people buying at the concession Thank stand. So it's not as easy as well. We'll charge ten dollars and you get ten new dollars. But that's a longer yeah. conversation. That's a long conversation. So the projection you're speaking of, if, if you got your ten, one tenth, it'd be twenty nine, thirty million. Twenty nine, if, if yeah. the city and all four counties are per, per year. So you do a bond or something, or is that what you're going to bond it out or something like that? Well, don't get wedded to the tenth. They, 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 haven't even, they haven't even come up with an open. They do believe it'll be less than an eighth. Yeah, we we could use that to attack the infrastructure issues up front. I was saying, so yeah. you would have to do it. Then you do a bond issue of some kind. Yeah, of it really. It, it, yes, I think that that's that's probably the direction we would go. But that said, there's only so much you can do at a time. So you can't, you couldn't bite off 50 million at once. Of course, you'd have to close the whole zoo down for a year. So that's not possible. So you'd have to, you'd have to do it gradually. So I don't think you'd want to bond the whole amount. But you, you, to attack those big infrastructure issues, you have to, have to get a uh, fair amount of money up front. Mm -hmm. I think we should move on. I know. I mean, this is this is a topic that everyone is going to be discussing, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of opportunities for us to ask questions and obviously get uh, information from a variety of sources on the issue. So I think this is just a good first step for you folks to give and us, that's how give we us a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. If you have information you see, get to those ladies, they'll get it to us. So we're ready to review it. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terry, you're probably um, more versed yes. as the folks that want to speak next. Yes, come on up, oh. folks. So we, we brought a big family. Well, that's <laughs> good. Yeah, you got room for three. You get room chairs. Three, four. Yeah, three, four. We can always play musical chairs. <laughs> sure. Sister, I don't know where to go. Sister, go right there. Yes, there's the end. How are you guys? Marion, how are you enjoying your retirement? Uh, I, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I'll let you know. Good evening. My, my the name floor is, is yours. My name is Jamie Apsel, and I'm the program manager for Seniors Count. I'm here today to speak in support of requested legislation for a senior service fund. Seniors Count is a initiative that was first started by the Daughters of Charity Foundation. The Daughters of Charity are one of the few foundations left in the region who provide funding for not-for-profit organizations that serve the elderly. They have seen an increase in the number of older adults <coughs> needing assistance while funding for these services stay stagnant. The Daughters of Charity discovered that there was a statute on the books in Missouri since 1990 which allows counties to fund a senior service tax, very similar to the Children's Service Fund. This fund would provide a revenue source to assist organizations who currently serve the elderly. The funds would generate it would be generated by a property tax that would equate to $9.50 a year for a home that's valued at $100,000, so less than a dollar a month. If passed, this tax is expected to generate about $4 million annually for St. Charles County. The Senior Service Fund would provide revenue for needed services that allow older adults basic assistance to age in place in the community. This allows them to stay in their community and avoid being prematurely institutionalized. This could impact a wide array of individuals. For example, um, a, Korea, a Korean War veteran who needs a ramp to get in and out of his home, a widow and retired private school teacher who lives on a modest monthly income and needs assistance with making minor home repairs, a busy middle-aged couple who are not only taking care of their children, 
but are also supporting their aging parents and a blind elderly man who needs transportation to church and Meals on Wheels since he cannot see to shop or cook for himself. Since 1990, 51 of the 114 counties in Missouri have passed the Senior Service Fund. However, it's never been introduced in the St. Louis region. What started as an idea with the Daughters of Charity has now grown to a coalition of over 200 organizations who form the Seniors Count Initiative. With representatives from diverse organizations such as hospitals, businesses, social service providers, religious groups, foundations, and older adults. This is, this is an, an initiative that we're working in three separate regions. We're working in the city of St. Louis, St. Louis County, and St. Charles County, but it has to be voted on by each county individually. This is an issue that is of particular significance to St. Charles County as the population of residents 60 years of age and older is expected to increase from 12% in 2000 and is estimated to be at 27.5% in 14 short years, that, which is actually a higher than the national average. I'm not only here as the program manager, but as a St. Charles County resident and also someone who, who's own aging parents would have benefited for some, from such services. Um, growing up, my mother worked in the home and was there to take care of her parents because she did not have to give up an income to do so. But family dynamics have changed with two income households like my own. Families today are still sacrificing to care for their aging parents, but often have to choose between their parents or their job. Thank you for considering this issue that affects so many in our community, and I've asked a few of our key community leaders to show how this issue is impacting our county. Kyle? Well, I've met some of you gentlemen at uh, chamber <coughs> events and other functions throughout the years. Uh, but for those who I haven't connected with before, my name's Kyle Gaines. I am the Director of Community Relations for St. Charles County Ambulance District. Um, most of you are probably familiar with our organization, hopefully not too intimately. Um, we cover all 592 square miles of St. Charles County providing emergency and non-emergency care and transportation for residents here in our community. Um, our presence here tonight is a little bit different than the other agencies you're going to hear from. We're not here to argue for seniors count. We're not here to argue against it. We're simply here because we were asked to provide a little bit of statistical information about seniors utilization of our services here in recent years. Uh, when I pulled that data, what I found over the last five years is that individuals age 70 and older, uh, that call volume segment has increased by about 13% over the last five years. Individuals <coughs> age 60 to 70 has increased by about 21% over the last four years. Uh, you might be kind of asking, okay, how does that compare with overall call volume growth? Overall call volume growth is up 11% over that same time frame. Uh, so both of those segments are outpacing uh, general call volume growth. But the, when I got down into the numbers a little bit deeper, uh, the part that uh, I found most interesting was that between 2011 and 2014, citizens assist calls increased by 59%. Uh, now those calls would include things like an individual who has fallen and is unable to get, uh, get off the floor by themselves, or maybe uh, grandma or grandpa or mom or dad needs to go to a doctor's appointment, but their caregiver is unable to get them in and out of the house because there's no wheelchair ramp or no assistive devices, things well, like why that. Why did it go down last year? We did have a little bit of a, a excellent point that uh, we did have a little bit of a dip on that last year, uh, but those calls did still average more than 100 a month. And I'm not sure, you know, we're, it's still fairly early in 16, so I'm not sure if 15 was an anomaly year or if we'll look at that leveling back out a little bit. Uh, but still, between 11 and 14, we went from about 880 of those calls to 1,400 of them. So pretty substantial increase there. But over. You folks, I have an 87-year-old mother and a 90-year-old mother in law over this county. And you still just go get these calls. They're, you guys are billing those folks and you're taking taxes from them, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, so and not on call, your you know, volume goes up, so does your income. Oh, and, and like I said, sir, um, yeah. we're not here to advocate sure. for or against this. We're simply here mm -hmm. to provide some statistical information about seniors' utilization of our service. That's, that's all we're here to do sure. this evening. Um, the, but the, a lot of those citizens assist falls and those type of calls are preventable with some things such as home modifications and things like that. That's simply. Uh, the point that we wanted to make tonight and again provide that statistical information to everyone. Would this Thank include um, any kind of a um, bus service for seniors in an unincorporated area? Transportation, it's um, yeah so it can, it's the statute's written so it allows each county to decide how they want to utilize the funds 
And what our organization is doing is we are compiling, uh, finishing a needs assessment. We're actually doing a survey of older adults to see what they see are the top needs in order to age in the community. <coughs> and we've already done a survey of senior service providers, and we'll be able to compare the two and look for overlap just for St. Charles County. Speaking of transportation. She can talk to you about transportation. Well, for, for a councilman like myself or Mr. Cronin, it represents mostly rural areas. How would that work? I mean, so organizations um, that provide transportation would apply for the funds to be able to, you can't supplant existing services, but you can expand upon services and you can develop new and innovative services. Well, they, they, they can get rides now. You just have to, you know, you have to rely on family a bit. You also have, I think it's once a week you can go. So basically and, you, it's called essential um, types of transportation and um, essential means that you can go to the grocery store once a week possibly mm -hmm. if you're on the waiting list mm -hmm. and it means that you can go to the doctor once in a while but you can't go to your doctor is out of your juris the jurisdiction of the transportation you can't go to that doctor yeah, so where I'm having a problem with this and I'm a senior citizen myself and I, and I take care of a mother and mother-in-law that are elderly how are we helping them by raising their property taxes? That's the thing I've got. When you've got older people that are trying to stay in their homes anyway, I mean, we're, we're, it's like a catch-22. You're going to give them extra services, but you're going to charge them more tax time. If, and there's a great many people in my area, to be frank with you, that are moving to other counties, okay, and retirement. You've got Mark Twain Lake area, and Dave, Mr. Hammond knows that. That's like little St. Charles County now. They're you know, moving out of this county because the property taxes are already too high, and we're going to be going after them for a little bit more. Well, what we say, and I let Susan speak, but basically, at nine dollars and fifty cents a year, you couldn't get a taxi cab. You the couldn't problem, get transportation. The, the only problem with that is, is, is I'm not, I'm not discounting your value whatsoever. But it's nine fifty here. It's so much for the zoo, and then the school district, and it's this, and it's that, and it's this, and it keeps going, and keeps going, and that's the problem. But I'm not saying I'm opposed. I'm just saying when you say that. It's not just you, it's everybody else is standing in line for more money, and that's the problem. And, and our taxes and our school districts and everything create a very high tax base. Not, not a very high tax base, but you know. I think it demonstrates that when seniors are supporting schools, it's nice to see that younger families will support seniors. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with your theory or yeah. your content um, or your intention at all. Oh, just, no, I understand. Yeah. So let me talk to you about transportation because one of the biggest modifications you talked about in life is to give up driving. And so um, uh, you, it's hard to hear, but uh, men outlive their ability to drive by seven years and women by 10. And that's only because we typically live a little longer. So with that, I want to ask you if you know or have seen someone that shouldn't be driving. My mother, probably. Okay. <laughs> I've had to take keys away from somebody. That's yes. Situation. And so I understand. And so I'm Susan Kalish Bailey, and I'm the executive director of ITN St. Charles, and we provide dignified transportation for seniors and adults with disabilities here in St. Charles County. And dignified means the riders sit in the front seat. There is no advertisements on the side of our car, and there's no money. Transfers hands at the time of trans the, the transaction, and there is no tipping. We charge about one half of what it costs us to operate and about 30 to 40 percent less than taxi. We are, we are affiliated with a national organization, but we're a standalone 501c3, and we receive no monetary support. So the other half of our money comes from fundraisers, grants, and donations. So we, you have uh, the statistics in your folder, but we grew 50 percent in seven months from July through January, um, and we are continuing to grow. Uh, this past month, March, we did 920 rides here in St. Charles County, uh, and we've done over 30,000 rides in the six years that we've been here in business. 80% um, of our riders are seniors, and about, they do about 70% of our rides, and we take them for any reason, uh, 24 by seven. Um, and nearly 50% of our riders, to talk about what you said, uh, based on the annual survey by IT in America, make less than $25,000 a year. Um, so there are other providers here in St. Charles <coughs> County uh, that are limited, but they, they have restrictions. They only provide rides in that municipality, or they only provide rides on a certain day of the week, or they only say essential shopping. Um, and medical, and our founder, the ITN America founder said that putting somebody, uh, telling somebody they can only go uh, to medical appointments and essential shopping is like putting them on a 500 calorie diet, th diet three times a week. 
So we want our seniors to be engaged in the community. We want them to go out to eat. We want them to attend events. We want them to go shopping. That's also economics. That's, that affects our economics is if they're out in the community. Um, so we know that our seniors, ITN St. Charles seniors, that we provide transportation that are aging uh, in place, they do so because they have transportation. Um, we do use volunteers for as many rides as possible. Um, but to guarantee our service, which we do, people can call us up to 4 p.m. the day before, we have to hire part-time paid drivers. So we're looking at Seniors Count to help us to continue to be able to expand to serve St. Charles County. I can tell you right now, I don't know where your districts are, but we serve primarily the 70, uh, 40 corridor from St. Charles to Winsville. But outside of that area, it's hard for me to service because I don't have, you know, to hire a driver to, to run those distances. Mr. I just have, yeah, because we're, uh, okay. it's seven o'clock, but I'm just, um, how would this, is this, if, if this would be put on by ordinance form, I guess, for a vote to the people, right, Terry, is that Correct. what? Correct. And then what, what fund is it, well, who does it go to? How does that the, work? The, the way I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it would operate very, very similar to the CCRB mm -hmm. and the DDRB. Mm -hmm. The money would, all money raised, I mean, you know, from St. Charles County would stay in St. Charles County. I think that's very important. And the second thing would be, obviously, the money would be there. Steve would appoint a board just like the CCRB. These agencies, like this, you know, at various agents would, would come and request money. <coughs> and then the board would then distribute that money. Correct. So it would work very, very similar to what two very, very successful organizations that we already have, which is CCRB and DDRB. Correct? Correct. I want to give you a word. Correct. Very quickly, uh, and I know we're <laughs> running out of time. For Saints Joe Common and Care Services, we'll be one of those um, uh, filling out the competitive uh, uh, grants to receive these monies. For Saints Joe Common and Care Service, and I'm not going to read all this, but um, uh, we serve with 30%, 30% of the seniors we serve uh, fall within 15% of the medium income. That's the average about $7,500 a year. Those are the people we serve. And then the other, uh, we have that the no greater than $1,100 uh, a month kind of income. Um, there is no options for the seniors. We have in the past uh, several years, we have had a lot of senior housing being built, but they all have a long waiting list. Uh, just today, just today, uh, we had another three women uh, evicted out of the church, the National Church Senior Services, which is senior housing, which is right behind uh, on, on Mexico Road, behind the um, Pizza Hut, um, uh, because there is a new activity within the senior services that people did smoke cannot remain part of it is risk management. Well, that is well and good, but these are three women. They, they average between 72 and 78 years old. They have no option, uh, and the exit plan is to reform to the care service. Uh, we work very closely with Midis, but Midis doesn't take care. Midis does some assessment, but the referrals are the care service. Uh, we had an incident in St. Peter's just a couple weeks ago where code enforcement was called, the neighbors called, they were concerned about a senior, 83 years old, that they could smell feces outside of their, their house. Um, they, uh, uh, code enforcement went in, and no doubt about it, the woman, uh, although full capable, but due to depression and isolation, um, and she had uh, many issues. Uh, when senior services were called, senior services did went in into the house. They did an assessment and they referred the woman to the care service. So what I am telling you is that the reason that we will be a candidate for these funds is for case management. The case management need for seniors over 60 years old has increased by leaps and bounds. So. As a person that has been here since the early 70s and, and our DDRB were successful, our three, um, uh, our three at risk uh, 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 demographics are the developmentally disabled and we passed the DRB. Then our children and we passed CCRB. And this we must as a community make the provisions. We have to make the provisions for our seniors, which many of us are part of that category for the people that do not have other options. And many of you said, well, there is insurances. Several of our women that have been in the streets in the last 
two years that referred to us, and we have housed. These are people, homeowners in this community that raised their children, but because of catastrophic reasons, they lost everything. And now they had depended on the care service to do the case management to rehouse them. So that's what we're here for. Uh, I do hope that you, re uh, you support every one of you, uh, preposition S. It is a must, it's, it's, it's dignity for the seniors to, um, to age in place. We do not, as taxpayers, have the ongoing tax monies either for Medicaid beds. Medicaid beds are just about non-existent in St. Charles, and that's the only option that we have for these folks is to put them in Medicaid beds. So um, thank you very much on my behalf, and please. We have time for one more. We're about out, okay? Just a minute. A minute. Just a minute. Uh, my name is Stacey Tulabas. I'm the president of the St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. I'll take my three pages and make it very quick. So you talked about why why seniors, you've got lots of choices you have to make. So um, this 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 um, seniors count will support seniors where they want to be, which is in their homes and in their communities. Alzheimer's disease is not a natural part of aging. It's age related. It's not the ozone. Um, you've heard the numbers. You know the numbers. One in nine over 65 will get Alzheimer's. Go back and look at the numbers in St. Charles County and the numbers are, that are affected are astronomical. One in three over 85 will get Alzheimer's disease. So you're, if you're wondering why, it's because of the epidemic triple growth. Um, you're seeing it right now. Your community is seeing it. You're probably seeing it yourselves, um, each one of you, your neighbors. But let's talk about the cost and the economics of Alzheimer's <coughs> disease. Alzheimer's disease is now the most expensive disease in the United States. So again, why, why should we talk about seniors? It's the most expensive. And what's frightening is that people think that Medicare is going to pay for it, and it's not. Um, it is absolutely not. That's absolutely frightening. So we've got to do something about it. Services that we provide, as an example, a respite care service. If that, we've talked. People talk about how that forestalls their their need to have to go to an institution. If you can do that for one month, that saves somebody five to ten thousand dollars on a cost of sixty to eighty thousand a month. So thank you for your consideration. This is an investment into your community at large, and we appreciate you considering the investment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming thank in. You. Okay. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll call the end of the work session. Get ready for the rest of the meetings. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Mary. Whoever's closer.